Welcome everybody to the Back to Basics Ministries online Bible study class tonight. And tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to take a look at the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. I put announcements out about this and we started part one two weeks ago. We take another look at the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. Okay, and I'll be working from um, a Bible that my mother gave me some years ago. It's an old book that she found. She and my dad in one of their ventures when they were in the flea market business. That was, wow, 20 years ago or more. And this Bible was produced by the Holman Company in Philadelphia in 1873. A.J. Holman and Company, Philadelphia, 1873. And it includes the Apocrypha and a Concordance and the Psalms. So this is one of those Bibles that had the Apocrypha included in it. This particular Bible has a you can put a lock on it, has a clamp on the end, and um, and it's all brown. The pages are brown and dusty. So I guess I should be wearing a mask while looking at it with allergies, but uh, we'll take a we'll work from it anyhow without the mask. Let me get it ready. And I hope you all are doing fine. Praise God. I pray that all of you are doing very well. We are welcome our international community and those who join us by way of the recording. Pray that you all are doing well in your different nations. And um, since I opened this Bible, I feel a sneeze coming on. So if I have to sneeze, please forgive me. Anyhow, what our lineup looks like tonight is we're going to take a look at several books in the Apocrypha. And this word apocrypha is Greek. It's translated to mean hidden books. Hidden books. The apocrypha are the hidden books, the so-called hidden books. There are those who go around and claim that, well, we've got the hidden books. We we know more Bible than you all. We've got the hidden books. And uh, there are pastors who, who preach this. And so um, I'm going to ask Gene Bratton to say something about the Apocrypha while I sneeze. Come on, Dr. Jane. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, the Apocrypha, when people say they have the hidden books of the Bible, well, if they were hidden, how did they get them? So it's out there. It's in the uh, Catholic Bible and some other um, religious um, denominations have the Apocrypha in their Bible. I have an old Bible also. Um, it's a pulpit Bible from maybe the early 1900s from the Methodist Church, the African Methodist Church. It's falling apart also, and it has the Apocrypha in it. So it's out there. It's not hidden. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jane. Thank you, Dr. Bratton. Praise God. You know, we're in the archives tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, that Just opening this Bible brought on a, a sneeze, you know. And so uh, thank you, Dr. Jane Bratton, for substituting pinch hitting. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you for having you in the wings. I appreciate you very much. Praise thank God. You. Praise God. So... Um, a lot of churches, as Dr. Jean says, use the Apocrypha in their preaching, in their teaching. But we do not. We do not believe that um, these books were accepted in the uh, Council of the Bishops in 250 B.C., nor in the Nicene Council, the Council of Nicaea, 325 A.D. And so um, even though one of the writers of, or reputed writers, is Ezra, and who he wrote first and second Ezra's. These books are not attributed to Ezra. 
um, they believe that someone taking Ezra's name uh, wrote this. But all in all, you can glean some good history from First and Second Ezra, First, Second, Third, and Fourth, the Maccabees. We're going to take a look tonight at First Ezra. I'm going to read a portion from it and let you know that this book parallels with the book of Ezra and also Second Chronicles, parts of Second Chronicles. Then we'll look at Tobit, the book of Tobit, and I'll share some excerpts from Tobit. We'll share some excerpts from Tobit. Then we read about Judith. Now, a lot of uh, ladies in the audience will really uh, like this because several of, you are, several of you are into women in the Bible and women in the Scriptures. Now, even though this book, Judith, is not canonized or accepted in the canon, it's good history. And you're going to meet a bad sister. I mean, this was, I mean, she was, she was a bad sister, okay? You don't want to mess with Judith. Then we look at the book called The Rest of Esther. And then a little bit from the book called The Wisdom of Solomon. Next week we'll continue with uh, books of the Pseudepigrapha. And then we'll wrap up the course after that okay this is re week 10 uh we'll study the apocrypha and pseudepigrapha next week Minnesota and then Nevada. have a summary in two more weeks so we welcome you to the class and praise god we're going to ask uh jackie carter uh she will lead us in prayer tonight hello father we thank you for the opportunity to gather again by way of technology, Lord, in order to hear more of your word and the word that you have for us through Pastor Carter. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for health and strength and for a sane mind. So many things that people take for granted. We ask that you speak now through Pastor Carter as he shares with us so that we may become more enlightened and we may become wiser and that we will not be drawn by folly and foolishness, Father God, but by wisdom and that which is ordained by you. We ask that you speak through him to us and that we be receptive to what he has for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much. Okay, the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, part two. We're continuing where we left off two weeks ago. And tonight we will look at first Esdras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther, and the wisdom of Solomon. These are apocryphal books. The word apocrypha meaning hidden books. So when your friends in the Masonic Lodge or the secret society say, we, we know the hidden books, we've got the hidden books of the Bible. You tell them, no, they were not accepted by the biblical bishops, the bishops who put the Bible together, whom God selected to choose the writings. No, these books were not accepted by the Council of Nicaea. And so tell them, no, you don't have anything that uh, God is trying to hide from us. You know, that's how God, that's how Satan deceived Eve in the garden. Satan caused Eve to think, well, you know, God said, did not God say, thou shalt not uh, eat uh, uh, the fruit? Thou shalt not even uh, 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 eat this fruit, touch this fruit, and, 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 and this and that, and if so, you'll, be, you'll surely die. And Eve said, yeah, well, you won't die. You won't die. And, and the serpent, Satan, beguiled Eve to make her think that God was trying to hold back something from her. And so uh, Eve, in her curiosity, she sinned against God and then caused her husband to sin against God. Adam, who had the responsibility for his, his household, the spiritual responsibility, allowed his 
responsibility to be taken, usurped by the devil. And uh, men and women all over the world these days are allowing the devil to steal their, their power, their authority. Jesus has given us all authority. And so if you deny Jesus Christ, you're denying your kingdom authority. So use the authority God has given you. If Satan has deceived you, repent and get back where you ought to be. Get back on the, 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 the watchtower that God has placed you on. Walk in the authority. Walk in kingdom authority. And, uh, for, and I say this to many, many people who have been deceived by the news. I mean, you, uh, I heard a, a message from a friend of ours yesterday. We don't watch CNN news anymore uh, because it's, it's, it's biased. Well, w so they returned to Fox News. Hey, you walked out of the fire into the cauldron. You've walked into the fiery furnace. Okay, you've got to discern for yourself what is truth and what is not. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so I say all this, whether it's to hear preaching from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or from 1st and 2nd Esdras, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and Maccabees. If you're not alert, people can pull the wool over your eyes, and Satan can deceive you. And so we, we, we put it out there out front to you. The books we're teaching tonight, tonight are not scripture. They are not scripture. Well, they've, they've been accepted in the Greek Bible. Well, uh, are, are you Greek? You're a Greek Christian? Not to put down Greek Christians, but the Greek Bible is incorrect. Well, I'm from a Roman Catholic background. Well, the Roman Catholics were incorrect in, in canonizing these books. And so um, God has given us these scriptures, 66 books from Genesis through Revelation. And they have been approved by the Holy Spirit. And even though some of the writers of these uh, false books or hidden books may have been writers of uh, the Gospels or uh, writers of books now in the Bible, these writings were not approved. The authorship has been challenged in many cases. Historical events have been challenged in many cases. And so... So we preserve these books as um, good uh, examples of getting into the culture of the times and the historicity of the time or the history of the times, but we do not accept these books based on the fact that God ordained councils, ladies and gentlemen, the council in 250 B.C. and the council in 325 A.D. God ordained councils for the specific, specific purpose of the Holy Spirit directing the bishops and the elders to choose the books, the various, from the various books. They had hundreds of writings, and God uh, anointed men to choose which books would be in his word, his Bible, the word of God. Having said that, um, I have before me a first Esdras. Esdras is another word for Ezra. And so I'm going to be taking it. I'll read a few, uh, some lines from chapter 2 of 1 Esdras. And as I read this, we're looking at, you can see parallels in Second Chronicles 36 and Ezra 1, verse, starting with verse 1. And in this um, chapter 2, Cyrus is moved by God to build the temple. And he gives leave to the Jews to return and contribute to it. He delivered again the vessels which have been taken from the temple. And Artaxerxes forbids the Jews to bid any more. So in, in the second chapter, we read about how Ezra, how Cyrus proclaimed that the temple shall be rebuilt. And that's historical fact. Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus would decree a return of the Jews and the rebuilding of the temple. But also in this chapter you'll see that the, uh, Cyrus received a, a, a letter from the Jews 
I'm sorry, from the enemies of the Jews, saying they are deceiving you. They are not a, a, intending to uh, build a temple or to uh, obey your laws. They're, they're rebellious. Check in your your historical archives, and you'll see that they are a rebellic, rebellious nation. And so the king did that, and as a result, the kings uh, called a halt to the construction. So here is from First Esther chapter two, starting with verse one. In the first year of, king, of Cyrus, king of Persians, of the Persians, that the word of the Lord might be accomplished, that he had promised by the mouth of Jeremy, mean Jeremiah. The Lord raised up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of the Persians, and he made proclamation through all his kingdom and also by writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of the Persians, the Lord of Israel, the most high, God, high Lord, hath made me king of the whole world and commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Jewry. And if therefore there be any of you that are of, the, of his people, let the Lord, even his Lord, be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem that is in Judea, and build the house of the Lord of Israel. For he is the Lord that dwelleth in Jerusalem. Whosoever then dwell in the places about, let him help him, those I say that are his neighbors, with gold and with silver, with gifts, with horses, and with cattle and other things which have been set forth by vow for the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the chief of the families of Judea and of the tribe of Benjamin stood up, the priests also and the Levites, and all they whose mind the Lord had moved to go up and to build a house for the Lord at Jerusalem. And they that dwelt around about them and helped them in all things with silver and gold with horses and cattle, and with very many free gifts of a great number whose minds were stirred up thereto. King Cyrus also brought forth the holy vessels, which never, now they don't call him Nebuchadnezzar in this Bible. He's called Nebuchadnezzar, 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 meaning Nebuchadnezzar, had carried away from Jerusalem and had set up in his temple of idols. Verse 11, we're in 1 Ezra, Ezra, Esdras, chapter 2. Now when Cyrus, king of the Persians, had brought them forth, he delivered them to Mithridates, his treasurer. And by him they were delivered to Sanabassar, the governor of Judea. And this was the number of them, a thousand golden cups and a thousand of silver censers of Silver, etc., etc. Okay, so we see Cyrus issuing the decree and um, authorizing the people who would, those who want to go back to Jerusalem, to go back to Jerusalem. And um, Cyrus issues this, this decree to Sanabassar, the governor of Judea, whom I believe is a re reference to. Um, Oh, I wasn't saying now. Okay, the governor. Um, I'll get it to come back to me. Help me, Gene Bratton. We've been teaching to call his name for the last couple of weeks. The uh, governor who who led the first wave of captivities of captives back to uh, Jerusalem. Are, okay, are you talking? Are you going what? back to Ezra and Nehemiah? Yes, back to those the time books? of Ezra and Nehemiah. Yeah, the uh, the governor who was the governor who was the appointed governor of the the um, uh, governor Darius was the king. Yes, it starts with a Z. It'll come to anyway, me. It'll, it'll come, come. Yeah, look up, look up Ezra Ezra one one Gene while we're going on. Okay, Ezra one one, and um, are, look up. Are you thinking man. about Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel, there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Karen. Zerubbabel. Oh, so I've, I've just read Zerubbabel's other name, Sanabassar, the governor of Jude Judea. So Zerubbabel is also known as, as Sanabassar, according to First Esdras. Now, 
uh, Esdras issued the decree, but then when the enemies of the Jews, and then when you look at Ezra, when you look at Nehemiah, you see Sanballat, you see Geshem, you see Tobiah, and on the, the enemies of the Jews, they rise up and send a letter back to Artaxerxes or to Cyrus. And Cyrus was, the, Cyrus was the, actually the symbolic name of the king. The king's real name was Artaxerxes. And so these people send a letter back to the king and, and tell them, be suspicious of these builders. They don't have your best interests in mind. And when you check your historical record, you'll see that they were rebellious and they were enemies of, of the Persians. And so um, they halted the building of the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And so the building of the temple was halted for 14 years, ladies and gentlemen, until uh, God stirred the heart of his prophets, Haggai and, and, um, and others. He stirred their hearts, and, 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 and those prophets began prophesying, and the Jews began to rebuild the temple. And so we find that uh, even... Even in the return of the Jews from captivity, Satan was busy to try to prevent the people from returning to their land, trying to prevent them from building the temple, trying to prevent Zerubbabel or Sanabassar. Uh, try, Satan tried to prevent Nehemiah, and Ezra was right there. So whether or not Ezra is the real writer of first Ezra, as it is reputed, we don't know, but Ezra is writing and uh, we see this writing in the Apocrypha, and we see the writing, the, the account given in the book of Ezra, and also in Second Chronicles, which was written by Ezra. Okay, and so all in all, the Jews finished the wall, and uh, a number of them returned, but not a great number. Not a great number. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Bratton writes in the window why I don't accept the apocryphal books. Jesus and his disciples quoted often from Old Testament scriptures. They never quoted anything from the apocryphal book writing. She said, hmm. Now, when you look at, um, in, in the New Testament, when you look at the book of Jude, Jude, when we look at Jude, there is a portion of Jude that is believed that Paul um, quoted from uh, some of the apocryphal books. Okay, Jude is just a short chapter, and read Jude, there is a portion, there is a portion of Jude that is believed that Paul did quote from um, one of the books, but it doesn't tell you which book. Um, I haven't, I did not research that out too well today, and I don't have any, anything specific to give to you. But, um, Dr. Gene, you're correct. Jesus never quoted from the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha. He quoted from the Psalms and the, 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 the prophets and the writings. Okay, um, but there are a couple of the evangelists, Paul being one, who it's reputed that they did make some references, references to historical books uh, to, to share some facts with people. But as far as specifics, we don't know. Okay, any questions on this uh, class so far? Any questions thus far? Okay, if not, then we're going to move to a book called Tobit, T-O-B-I-T, Tobit. We're going to look at Tobit and see what this book is all about. I'm going to read a few excerpts from the book of Tobit. Keep in mind, Pastor Carter does not preach from the Apocrypha. I do not preach from the Pseudepigrapha. I do not encourage you to do so. I take a stand with the bishops of the church and the elders of the, of the Jewish community that these 
Uh, and I take my stand with the Holy Spirit that these were not um, canonized books. I take my stand with the, the, the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. I do not stand with those who preach from the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha. I do not stand with the Masod, Masonic order. I am not a Mason. I do not agree with uh, their theology. Okay? I agree with the Word of God as it is given us in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. I agree with them. I also agree with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. That's what I agree with, and I pray that you agree with uh, those 66 books also. Praise God. I was not trying to show off, but I was just trying to show you that I committed these books to memory a long time ago. And I encourage you to put commit your books to memory. Uh, don't depend on flipping to the table of contents. Get these books in your spirit. Not only the order of the books, but get the contents in your spirit. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't rightly divide the scripture as the word of truth, you'll be blown away like many followers of the Mormon church who, uh, who follow the writings of Joseph Smith and, 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 and um, have the book of the Mormon, which is an aberration of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not alert, you'll be a follower of the Koran, and then you'll be looking dumb like a lot of other our people with some of our Supreme Court justices and uh, people being uh, uh, um, um, and being installed in offices, official offices in the United States, looking and putting their left hand on the Koran and lifting their right hand up to God. Ladies and gentlemen, that is blasphemy. You can't raise, you can't put your left hand on the Quran and raise your right hand to God. That that is, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. God is not the author of the Quran. God is the author of the Holy Scriptures. All Scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. But see, if you don't know, then you don't know. And if you don't know, you'll be deceived. And a lot of people are being deceived out of ignorance. A lot of people believe that Quran supersedes the Bible. No, no, a thousand times no. The Bible, uh, the New Testament was written, uh, uh, at least the New Testament was finished and canonized in 325 A.D. The Quran was written around 550 A.D. And so the, the Bible was complete before the Quran even was written. And the Quran is an aberration, ladies and gentlemen. It's a blur of the truth. And, and, and when you get a blur of the truth, you get falsehoods and lies. And so what we have today is a lot of people believing lies, and they will kill you based on the lies that they believe. But we are to stand, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, with our loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, wearing the helmet of salvation, having shoes on our feet that will speed the preparation of the gospel of peace, having our, the belt of truth around us, and, and taking the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and taking the sword of the Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. That's the word of God. It's a two-edged sword. The sword of the Spirit cuts through all that 
garbage, all that mess, all the falsehoods, all the lies. And in addition to that, ladies and gentlemen, we have been equipped by the Holy Spirit to cast down all vain imaginations and every high thing that, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Praise God. And taken captive, God has given us the ability by the Holy Spirit to take captive every thought in obedience to Christ Jesus. That's the stand that the Christians ought to be taking today and not, uh, not even entertaining demons and entertaining uh, thoughts from other books. But yet we must read these things to know where the enemy is coming from. Well, I think I just gave a good old overview and a stand on your guard post to stay alert, alert and stay awoke uh, 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 sermon right there. But let's take a look at Tobit. Okay. The book of the words of Tobit, son of Tobiel, the son of Anan Ananiel, the son of Aduel, the son of Gabael, of the seed of Asael, of the tribe of Naphtali, so Tobit was of the tribe of Naphtali, who in the time of Anamesar, king of the Assyrians, was led captive out of Thisbe, which is at the right hand of that city, which is called properly Naphtali in Galilee above. Okay. And so um, Anamesar, when you look at Second Kings, you, 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 you see Anamesar. He goes by a different name. Okay, I think, it's, I think it's Sennacherib. Sennacherib is his name. Verse 3, I, Tobit, have walked all the days of my life in the way of truth and justice, and I did many alms deeds to my brethren and my nation who came to me to Nineveh into the land of the Assyrians. And so uh, Tobit, uh, this person Tobit, lived at the time of Jonah. Okay, at the time of Jonah, Jonah prophesied after the Assyrians had, had uh, Jonah prophesied before the Assyrians came and captured the northern kingdom in 721 B.C. Verse 4, and when I was in mine own country, in the land of Israel, being but young, all the tribes of Naphtali, my father, fell from the house of Jerusalem which was chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, that all the tribes should sacrifice there, where the temple of the habitation of the Most High was consecrated and built for all ages. And, and so Tobit is saying, as a young man, the tribes uh, 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 around my father's area, they broke away from Jerusalem. They were commanded to go to Jerusalem to worship. Now all the tribes which together revolted, and the house of my father Naphtali sacrificed unto the heifer Baal. Uh, uh, Toby calls Baal a heifer, a heifer, uh, Baal. So he said all the tribes broke away from Jerusalem and began to worship Baal. But I alone, verse 6 of chapter 1 of Tobit, but I alone went off into Jerusalem at the feast as it was ordained unto all the people of Israel by an everlasting decree, having the first fruits and the tenths of increase, took the first fruits and the tithes, which that which with that which was first shorn, and then gave I at the altar to the priests, the children of Aaron. The first tenth part of all increase I gave to the sons of Aaron, who ministered at Jerusalem, Another tenth part I sold away and went and spent it every year in Jerusalem. And the third I gave unto them to whom it was meet, as Deborah, my father's mother, had commanded me, because I was left an orphan by my father. So we learned that Tobit had been an orphan, and his mother commanded him to tithe. Furthermore, when I was come to the age of a man, I married Anna of mine own kindred. And I of her begat Tobias. So Tobit was the father of, of a man named Tobias. And when we were carried away captive to Nineveh, so he places this at the time of the captive captivity by the Assyrians. Tobit says he was carried away to Nineveh. So that happened in the year 721 B.C. Furthermore, when I was come to the age of a man, oh, and when we were carried away captive to Nineveh, all my brethren... And those that were of my kindred did eat of the bread of the Gentiles. But I kept myself from eating. 
because I remembered God with all my heart. So Esther, I'm sorry, Tobit said he refused to eat the food of the Ninevites. He continued to eat the food that was ordained by God, the kosher food. And the Most High gave me grace and favor before Anamessar, meaning Sennacherib, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, as that I was his purveyor. Purveyor means he was his purchasing agent. He became the purchasing agent for the king. And I went into Media and left in trust with Gabael, the brother of Gabrius, at Rages, a city of Medea, ten talents of silver. So this is a little bit about him. Um, verse 20, Then all my goods were forcibly taken away. Neither was there anything left me besides my wife Anna and my son Tobias. Let, back, let me back up a verse, okay? And when one of the Ninevites went and complained of me to the king that I buried them and hid myself, I understand that I was sought to be put to death. So he was put to death for burying people who the king of Nineveh had slain. And Tobit buried them. And so he was punished for burying them. Okay, chapter 2. Now when I was come home again and my wife Anna was restored unto me and my son Tobias in the feast of Pentecost, which is, it, is the holy feast of the seven weeks, there was a good dinner prepared me in the which I sat down to eat. And when I saw abundance of meat, I said to my son, Go and bring what poor man soever thou shalt find out of our brethren who is mindful of the Lord, and lo, I tarry for thee. So go and gather the poor who, who believe in God and bring them to this table. But he came again and said, Father, one of our nation is strangled and is cast out in the marketplace. Then before I had, I had tasted of any meat, I started up and took him up into a room unto the going down of the sun. Then I returned and washed myself and ate my meat in heaviness, remembering that the prophecy of Amos, as he said, your feast shall be turned in the morning and all your mirth into lamentation. So Tobit mention, mentions the prophecy of Amos. Then he said, uh, and my wife Anna did take women's works to do. So they were poor, so his wife took in house clean, house, housework. And when she had sent them home to their owners, they paid their wages and gave her besides a kid. So um, they gave her a goat because she washed people's clothes. And when it was in my house and began, and began to cry, I said unto her, from whence is this kid? In other words, where is this goat from? Is it not stolen? Render it to the owners, for it is not lawful to eat anything that is stolen. But she replied unto me, it was given for a gift more than the wages. Howbeit I did not believe her, but bade her render it to the owners, and I was abashed at her. But she relied, replied unto, upon me, Where are thine alms and thy righteous deeds? Behold, thou and all thy works are known. So she said, Hey, your works are known. You're a righteous man. So someone has given us this goat. Chapter 3 is all about Tobias grieved with his wife's taunts and, and prayers, and he prayed. Then um, an angel sent to help them. Then I, being grieved, did weep, and in my sorrow prayed, saying, O Lord, thou art just, and all thy wor works and all thy ways are merciful and truth, and thou judgest truly and justly forever. Remember me and look on me. Punish me not for my sins and ignorance and the sins of my fathers, who have sinned before thee, and they obeyed not, for they obeyed not thy commandments. Wherefore thou hast delivered us for a spoil, and unto captivity, and unto death, and for a proverb of reproach to all the nations among them, we are dispersed. So this sounds like Jeremiah's prayer, um, and, and the burden of Jeremiah, uh, before all of Israel was taken captivity, into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, this sounds like some of the prayers of, uh, of Amos and some of the prayers of Hosea and others before Sennacherib uh, came from Assyria and captured the northern kingdom. 
And so it also sounds like Nehemiah's prayer. When Nehemiah stood before the Lord and said, we are in this situation because of our father's sins. And it sounds like some of our prayers here today, we're in this situation in America facing this coronavirus and the situation in the world because of the sins of our fathers, the sins of our leaders and our past leaders, and because of our own sins. Okay, so the angel of the Lord came and, and ministered to um, Tobit, okay? And there are just a couple more chapters. Tobit gives instructions to his son Tobias, telling him of the money that was left for him at a certain place. And Tobias goes and gets that money, okay? Um... These brown pages are stuck together, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see if I can open them. All right, chapter 5. Young Tobias seeketh a guide into media. The angel will go with him and saith he's his kinsman. Tobias and the angel depart together, but his mother is grieved for her son's departing. Anyway, to make a long story short, Tobias is rewarded. The angel of the Lord helps him according to this according to this account and Tobit and winds up Tobias marrying in, into a famous family and um, he's accepted by this family Tobit's son I've given my daughter in marriage to seven oh. Listen, this is, this is kind of weird, ladies and gentlemen. This man says, I have given my daughter to marriage, in marriage, to seven men who died that night they came in unto her. Nevertheless, for the present, be merry. But Tobias said, I will eat nothing here till we agree and swear one to another. And so Tobias is engaged to marry this woman. She's had seven husbands. But her marriage was never, never consummated because on the marriage, the night of each wedding to seven men, these men were killed by a demon. Okay, so that's another reason why people don't accept Tobit as being uh, a canonized book. Here's this woman. She's demon-possessed, and the demons have prevented seven men from consummating the marriage with her, and seven men have died. And so Tobit, uh, Tobit's son Tobias is uh, a betrothed to her. And so Raguel says that's the father of the, uh, the woman. Then take her from henceforth according to the manner, for thou art her cousin, and she is thine, and be merciful. And the merciful God give you good success in all things. Then he called his daughter Sarah, and she came to her father, and he took her by the hand and gave to her, gave her to be wife to Tobias, saying, Behold, take her after the law of Moses and lead her away to thy father. And he blessed them. And called Edna his wife and took paper and did write an instrument of covenants and sealed it. Then they began to eat. After Raguel called his wife Edna and said to her, to her sister, prepare another chamber and bring her in thither, which when she had done as he had bidden her, she brought her thither and she wept and she received the tears of her daughter and said unto her, be of good comfort, my daughter, the Lord of heaven and earth give thee joy for this thy sorrow. Be of good comfort, my daughter. Now you've got to take a look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Here's a woman. She has been married seven times. She's been at the altar seven times, but each of the seven marriages was never consummated. Her new husband on seven occasions was killed by a demon. So she's in grief. She, she, she never consummated any of her marriages until Tobias comes along. So uh, Tobias... Uh, According to this book, Tobit, he and his wife rose up to pray. Raguel thought he was dead, but finding him alive, praised God and made a wedding feast. Then chapter 9, 
Tobias sendeth the angel unto Gabriel for the money. The angel bringeth it to Gabriel, Gabriel, to the wedding. And Tobit and his wife long for their son. She will not be comforted for her husband, etc., etc. Anyway, to make a long story short, the angel of the Lord came to Tobias' rescue and cast out that demon that had caused this woman to uh, see seven husbands die, and then Tobit's son, Tobit's son, Tobias, became her husband, okay, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's Tobit, okay? Take it for what it's worth, that's Tobit. Now, I want to move on to another. Any, any questions? Uh, Karen, Dr. Jean, Brian? Hey, Brian, I don't think I want to marry anybody if, 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 de <laughs> if demons have killed. Brian, I don't think I want to marry anybody if demons have killed their husbands before they could consummate the marriage, and that happened on seven occasions. I don't think I want to be near her. Do you, Brian? <laughs> Also, what's strange I'm about I'm picking on that, Brian because Brian, 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 Brian's in love. Brian, you <laughs> It also you says that he used the gall, gallbladder and liver and the heart of a huge fish to fight off the demons. That story is really strange. That's and witchcraft. Used, a lot of witchcraft in there, yeah, Jane. And then he used, yeah, and then he used the same organs to cure his father's blindness. Yes, he, he, he went fishing. Yeah. He went fishing, and a fish jumped out of the river, and 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 the angel said to him, "Take that fish and cut his gallbladder, yeah. and bladder, and stomach, and liver, and this, and 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 he used that to cast out the demon out of the 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 uh, his wife, and then used it to heal somebody. His father was blind for seven years, so kind of uh kind of kind of kind of unbelievable, kind of strange. Yeah, but um. So, since Brian's the only young man I know who who's on with us tonight, and he's not married, but he's uh, uh, he's hitting 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 love kind of heavy and thinking about it. You check her, uh, you check her back. Every, you know, everybody ought to have a background check on your your your, your espouse. You know, Do you agree with that, Doctor Bratton? Yes. <laughs> Do an FBI check. Do a background check. Do a spiritual. You, most people don't do a spiritual check. They just go and get married. We're going to get married. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because when you're unequally yoked with an unbeliever, you're, when you marry that unbeliever, you're marrying those demons that have been assigned the territory that, of that person that you're going to marry. Any questions on that? Any comments on that? Everybody's quiet. Okay, so what the point is, you make sure you know if you're going to get married, if you, you, you or even if you're married, you know, you, you still, still do some research. Hey, What's my spouse been into? And and a, and and a lot of times we learn how to fight these battles that afflict our marriages and our families and our children and grandchildren and posterity. Okay, because a lot of people, uh, through witchcraft and necromancy and and marine spirits and and uh, people have held seances and made pacts with the dead and ghosts and and demon powers. And 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 then and then you marry one of them. That's why a lot of marriages need to be delivered. A lot of folks need to repent. Yeah. Uh, 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 we need to repent for who we used to worship and things we did. And every one of us need to do a good old uh, security check on ourselves. And then once you find out, you plead the blood of Jesus. Get the blood Amen. of Jesus in on that. Amen. I see uh, Co-Pastor Lisa Johnson's on board with us. Uh, Co-Pastor Lisa, we've been teaching this for years, haven't we? Sure have. Sure have. Amen to that. 
You got to do a, do a check because you don't know what you're getting until you got it. Don't know what you're getting. Though. But, but, Mom, ma, but, Mom, ma, but, Mom, ma, he's so pretty. I heard, <laughs> I, I heard, I heard one of my sisters say that. But, Mom, he's so pretty. Ma said, don't you mess with that boy. He, he's trouble. But, Mom, ma, I mean, he, my sister, I'm not talking about my, my sister Jackie, okay, my, my deceased departed sister. She said, but, Mom, he's so pretty. I mean, she didn't describe him as being ham. He's so pretty. Yeah, you better watch out for those pretty boys. Okay? Everything look good ain't good. And, and, and think of the many people whose lives have been messed up. And, 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 and we've all made mistakes by being hooked up with the wrong person. And, 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 and some of those mistakes we make, they last a lifetime. Some people never recover from, from, from uh, uh, being in close relationship with someone who has, been, has a, a pact, a, a, a relationship, or, or been possessed by demons. And so, so that's why, well, you may say, well, Pastor Carl, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Yes, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of that. And I'm one who would tell you, yes, yes, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. But if you don't know, if you're not born again, and if you have not surrendered to Jesus, and ladies and gentlemen, let's look at this. Every person born again has not been delivered. Mm -hmm. I'm going to repeat that. Every born again person has not been delivered. Just because, okay, you're saved now, and then you got you you you're you're engaged, and your fiance goes to church with you, that doesn't mean she's delivered. That's right. You're gonna find out what's influencing her. That's right. You're gonna find out who uh, what enemy she been sleeping in, and on the flip side, uh, sister, you better find out who he been sleeping with. I know it's tight, but it's right. Tight, but it's uh, right. Truth, anyhow. I've counseled a lot of people. I've had people hate me for this kind of counseling. Man, I had a couple come to me about 30 years ago, Dr. Bratton, and when it was all over, she got up and left the meeting, and he got up and shook his head at me, gave me the dumb look, and he went out and married her anyhow. And he caught hell. That marriage didn't even last a week. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and think of the many times in our own defiance. You, your mama said, mama said, oh, no, mama, don't mess up, don't marry her. I see something in her. But my mom, you don't see what I see. <laughs> mom, I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, mom. We don't roll the same way. You don't see what I see. And you don't feel what I feel. Do you see what I see? <laughs> And it turns right. Turns out, Karen, that Mama was right. Mama was right. Some of us have gotten in the messes. It's going to take eternity to get us delivered. Some of us will welcome all the rapture. <laughs> now, 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 look, look, look. Hey, Brian, I'm not trying to scare you off and getting married, man, but, Brian, there are some folks who will rel Welcome the rapture. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Deliver me from this. Come quickly. Some of us, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to change that because Jackie might say anything. Tell me, some of us. What you mean, some of us? Some people will Wait, welcome the rapture. It? Some people will welcome the rapture. Ooh, Karen, I've dug a hole for myself. So uh, let's move on, okay? There's a book in the Apocrypha called Judith. If you think Tobit was something, check out Judith. Okay? Here's a book called Judith, and not a whole lot of chapters. Let's see, how many chapters in Judith? How many chapters you got? Okay, you got 15 chapters. And um, Judith, Judith, this, was, this sister was... This sister was a mean sister. In the twelfth year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who reigned in Nineveh, so Judith was a contemporary of Tobias and Tobit. Okay, and talks about Nebuchadnezzar. He made the gates thereof, even gates that were raised 
to the height of 70 cubits, etc., etc. Then he sent to all those who dwelt in Persia and to all that dwelt westward and to those among the nations that were there, all who were in Samaria, okay, to come before him. And all the inhabitants of the land made light of the commandment of, of Nebuchadnezzar when they went with him to the battle, for they, they were afraid of him. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar was very angry with all his country because he called them to join him to go to battle, and they didn't come. And he swore by his throne and kingdom, verse 12, and he would surely be avenged upon all those coasts of Cilicia, Damascus, Syria, and that he would slay with the sword all the inhabitants of the land of Moab and the children of Ammon and all Judea and all that were in Egypt till ye come to the borders of the two seas. Then he marched in battle array with his power against King Arphaxad in the seventeenth year, and he prevailed in his battle, and he overthrew all the power of Arphaxad and all his horsemen and all his chariots. <clears throat> and he returned again to Nineveh, both he and all his company of sundry, sundry nations. And that describes, so we get a little history out of this. We get historically how Nebuchadnezzar overthrew Sennacherib, the Assyrian, who overthrew the ten tribes in 721 B.C. So Nebuchadnezzar came and overthrew them. Okay, chapter 2 of Judith. talks about the kingdom uh, okay so let's jump down to chapter 3 so they sent ambassadors unto him to treat of peace saying behold we the servants of Nebuchadnezzar the great king lie before thee use us as shall be good in thy sight behold our houses and our places and all our fields of wheat and flocks and herds and all the lodges of our tents lie before thy face Use them as it pleases thee. So this is about the overthrow of Nebuchadnezzar when the Persians came and defeated uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You get that history in Judith chapter 3. Chapter 4, the Jews are afraid of Holofernes and fortify the hills, etc. Now the children of Israel that dwelt in Judea heard all that Holofernes, the chief captain of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Assyrians had done to the nations and after that manner he had spoiled all their temples and brought them to naught therefore they were exceedingly afraid of him and were troubled for Jerusalem and for the temple of the Lord their God so they had heard about Nebuchadnezzar how he had destroyed uh, the Assyrian kingdom <clears throat> so they were afraid of him we're getting, we're working to the place where Judith comes on board. Chapter 5, not yet. Chapter 6, not yet. Okay. Still got a couple more brown pages stuck together. This is an old book, 1873, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter 7, they're still uh, preparing for... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 8, the state and behavior of Judith, a widow. She blameth the governor, governors for their promise to yield and adviseth them to trust in God. They excuse their promise. She promises to do something for them. <coughs> and so... Here comes Judith on the scene with all this background of killing and war and destruction and spoil and the children of Israel being in great fear. <laughs> Verse 8, chapter 8. Now at that time Judith heard thereof, which was the daughter of Merari, so she was a daughter of the Merarites, and actually she's from the priestly class of the Merarites. 
okay, who were three of the sons of uh, of um, Aaron. <coughs> so it gives her line her uh, genealogy. Talks about her husband, verse two. For as he stood overseeing them that bound sheaves in the field, the heat came upon his head. Her husband Manassas was binding sheaves in the field. He had a heat stroke. He fell on his bed <coughs> and died in the city of Bethulia, and they buried him with his fathers in the field between Dotham and Balamo. So Judith was a widow in her house three years and four months. Okay, keep in mind, she's a widow. And she made her a tent upon the top of her house and put it on sackcloth upon her loins and wore her widow's apparel. And she fasted all the days of her widowhood, save the eaves of the Sabbath and the Sabbath and the eaves of the new moons and the new moons until the feast and solemn days of the house of Israel. She was also of a godly countenance and very beautiful to behold. And her husband Manassas had left her gold and silver and men servants and maid servants and cattle and lands, and she remained upon them. So she was a widow. And she did not remarry. She kept her, her widow's garments on, and she was filthy rich. <clears throat> and there was none that gave her an ill word, for she feared God greatly. So Judah, Judah feared God. And people feared Judah. Now when she heard the evil words of the people against the governor, that they fainted for lack of water, for Judith had heard all the words of Ozias had spoken unto them, and that he had sworn to de deliver the city unto the Assyrians after five days, then she sent her waiting woman that had the government of all things that she had to call Ozias. And they came unto her, Hear me now, O ye governor, she said, of the inhabitants, for your words that ye have spoken before the people of this day are not right. Touching this oath which he had made and pronounced between God and you, and have promised to deliver the city to our enemies, unless within these days the Lord turned to help you. So she called all the leaders and said, uh, your oath is not right. And now... Who are you that have tempted God this day and stand instead of God among the children of men? And now try the Lord Almighty, but ye shall never know anything. For ye cannot find the depth of the heart of man, neither can ye perceive the things <clears throat> that he thinketh. Then how can ye search out God that hath made all these things and know this, his mind or comprehend his purpose? She said, because you don't know God, you don't know him, so how can you... Uh, 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 make these decisions without your knowledge of God. Nay, my brethren, provoke not the Lord our God to anger. For if he will not help us within these five days, he hath power to defend us when he will, even every day, or destroy us before our enemies. So the enemy has come upon Israel, <clears throat> and Judith, uh, in her, still wearing her close of mourning rallies the leaders of the Israelites and and says that we need to call on God. He can deliver us in these days. They were given a, an ultimatum by the, the king of the Assyrians. She said the Lord can help us within these five days and if he can't he can help us whenever he chooses to. That's what she's saying. Therefore let us wait for salvation of him and call upon him to help us, and he will hear our voice if it please him. For there arose none in our age, neither is there any other in these days, neither tribe nor family, nor people nor city among us, which worship gods, which, which worship gods made with hands, as hath been aforetime. For the which cause our fathers were given to the sword, and for a spoil, and at a great fall before our enemies. She's saying, it's because our fathers and ancestors and, and leaders will worship other gods and the gods of other nations that we're in this situation. So Judith is saying the same thing that Nehemiah said when he looked at the torn down, destroyed walls of Jerusalem. We are in this condition 
because our fathers sinned against God, we sinned against God, and we worship the gods <coughs> of other nations. And so um, Judas continues on. Then said Osias to her, All that thou hast spoken, thou hast spoken with a good heart. And there is none that may gainsay the, thy words. For this is not the first day wherein thy wisdom is manifested. But from the beginning of thy days, all the people have known thy understanding, because the disposition of thy heart is good. So that's a, that's a real commendation of uh, Judas. But the people were very thirsty and kept, compelled us to do unto them as we have spoken and to bring an oath upon ourselves which we will not break. Therefore now pray you for us because thou art a godly woman and the Lord will send us rain to fill our cisterns and we shall faint no more. Then said Judith unto him, Hear me and I will do a thing which shall go throughout all generations to the children of our nation. Ye shall stand this night in the gate and I will go forth with my waiting woman. And within the gates that ye have promised to deliver the city to our enemies, the Lord will visit Israel by thy hand. And so uh, Judith addresses these leaders who promised to surrender the city to the Assyrians. Judith said, I'm going to go in to this king, and I'm going to do something. And so sounds like Esther, you know, uh, if I perish, I perish. But inquire not ye of mine act, for I will not declare it unto you till the things he fin be finished that I do. She said, don't ask me what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it. But she said, what I'm going to do, the Jews will be talking about this for generations to come. Then said Ozias and the princess to her, go in peace, and the Lord God be before thee to take vengeance on our enemies. So they returned from the tent and went to their wards. Okay. So chapter 9, Judith humbleth herself. She prays to God in prayer uh, against the enemies of the Lord. Chapter 10, Judith does set forth herself. She and her maid go forth into the camp. The watch take and conduct her to Holofernes. Holofernes is the name of the leader of the army of the Assyrians. <clears throat> and then it starts to get exciting. She goes to the tent and, um, well, let me read this. Now, after that she had ceased to cry unto the Lord of Israel and had made an end to, of all these words, she rose where she had fallen down and called her maid and went down into her house in the which she abode in the Sabbath days and pulled off the sackcloth which she had on, and put off the garments of her widowhood. She washed her body all over with water, and anointed herself with precious ointment, and braided the hair of her head, and put on a tire upon it, she, okay, put something on her head, and put on her garments of gladness, wherewith she was clad during the time life of Manasseh, her husband. Judith uh, fixed herself up. She took the morning, clothes of mourning off. No longer was she dressing like a widow. She bathed. She put on ointment. And she prettied her house, herself up. And she took sandals upon her feet and put about her, her bracelets and her chains and her rings and her earrings and all her ornaments and decked herself bravely to allure the eyes of all men that should see her. She dolled herself up. Because she wanted to make get the attention of those men. And she gave her maid a bottle of wine and a cruise of oil and filled a bag with parched corn and lumps of figs and with fine bread. And she folded all these things together and laid them upon her. Thus they went forth to the gate of the city of Bethulia and found standing there Ozias and the ancients of the city. And the, the leaders of the city were waiting for her when, when she got there. And when they saw her, that her countenance was altered and her apparel was changed, they wondered at her beauty very greatly and said unto her, The God, the God of our fathers, give thee favor and accomplish thine enterprises to the glory of the children of Israel, to the exaltation of Jerusalem. Then they worshiped God. 
And she said unto them, Command the gates of the city to be opened unto me, that I may go forth to accomplish the things, accomplish the things whereof ye have spoken with me. So they commanded the young men to open unto her, and she, as she had spoken. And when they had done so, Judith went out, she and her maid with her, and the men of the city looked after her, and until she was gone down the mountain, until she had passed the valley and could see her, her no more. Woo. And um, they took her and asked her, said, Of what people art thou, etc.? And I am coming before Holofernes, she said. She said, I am a woman of the Hebrews, and have fled from them, for they shall be given you to be consumed. So um, Judith told the Jewish leaders before she left, I'm going to go, and I'm going to tell a lie. I'm going to deceive the Assyrians. And so she said, here's her deception. She said, I am a woman of the Hebrews, which was true, and I fled from them, which is not true, for they shall be given you to be consumed. For I am coming before Holofernes to declare words of truth, and I will show him a way whereby he shall go and win all the hill country without losing the body or life of any one of his men. She said, I'm here to show your captain the way to defeat the Jews and to take this city and, and without losing any one of your men. Now when the men heard her words and beheld her countenance, they wondered greatly at her beauty and said unto her, Thou hast saved thy life in that thou hast hastened to come down to the presence of our Lord. Now therefore come to his tent and some of us shall conduct thee until they have delivered thee to his hands. They said, you, you, uh, because of your accountants and the things you've said, we're not going to kill you. We're going to take you to our captain. Then they chose out of them a hundred men to accompany her and her maid, and they brought her to the, to the tent of Holofernes. This is dramatic. It gets, gets even more dramatic. And they wondered at their, her beauty and admired the children of Israel because of her. And everyone said to his neighbor, who would despise this people that of among them such women? Wow, how can you hate the Jews when they got such pretty women? That's what they were saying. Surely it is not good that one man of them be left, who being let go might de deceive the whole earth. So we need to kill these Jews, they said, because uh, uh, they let something like this get away. They don't deserve to live. That's what they're saying. Okay, and when Judith was come before Holofernes and his servants, they all marveled at the beauty of her countenance. And she fell down upon her face and did reverence unto him, and his servants took her up. And she, I mean, she acted this thing out. She fell down before him, ladies and gentlemen. She was all dialed up. He was mesmerized by her beauty. And she fell down at his face, at, at, at his feet. And, and she was ready, ready to perform her act of deception. Then said Holofernes unto her, Woman, be of good comfort, comfort. Fear not in thy heart, for I never hurt any that was willing to serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of all the earth. Now for, if the people that dwelleth in the mountain had not set light by fire, I would not have lifted up my spear against them, but they have done these, etc., etc. Anyway, let's get down to the good part. He prepared a meal for her. Okay? There's not such a woman from one end of the earth to the other, both for beauty of face and wisdom of words. I mean, she had him now in the palm of her hands, Brian. She had him in the palm of her hands. And he said, there's not such a woman from one end of the earth to the other, both for beauty of face and wisdom of words. Likewise, Holofernes said unto her, God have done well to send thee before the people, that strength might be in our hands and destruction upon them that lightly regard my Lord. And now thou art both beautiful in thy countenance and witty in thy words. Surely, if thou doest thou hast spoken, thy God shall be my God. 
and thou shalt dwell in the house of King Nebuchadnezzar and shall be renowned through the whole earth. He told her, if you're, if you're able to pull off what you promise you're going to do, your God's going to be my God. Okay? She, okay, so the next chapter. I mean, this is dramatic. Then he commanded to bring her in where his plate was set, and bad that she should prepare for her of his own meats, and that she should drink of his own wine. And he, she said, I will not eat thereof, lest there be an offense, but provision shall be made for me of the things that I have, I have brought. So she refused to eat because she said she was there on a mission. Okay? So she refused to, to eat. Uh, further on in this chapter, Then said, Hollow fairness unto her, Drink now, and be merry with us. So Judah said, I will drink now, my Lord, because my life is magnified in me this day, more than all the days since I was born. Then she took and ate and drank, before him what her maid had prepared. And Holofernes took great delight in her and drank much more wine than he had drunk at any time in any day since he was born. Listen, listen, listen. Okay, he schemed. He, he just, he, let me back up to verse 16 because this is dramatic. Now when Judith came in and sat down, Holofernes' heart was ravished with her. He was blown off, his, off the planet. And his mind was moved, and he desired greatly her company, for he waited a time to deceive her from the day that he had, had seen her. He knew, he knew then he was going he was, he was to score. He just knew he was going to score. He was going to do the hat trick. Then said Holofernes unto her, Drink now and be merry with us. So Judah said, I will drink now, my Lord, because my life is magnified in me this day more than all the days since I was born. She said, I'll drink now. I'll eat now. And I'll drink now. This is the greatest day of my life because I'm before you. Then she took and ate and drank before him what her maid had prepared. And Holofernes took great delight in her and drank much more wine than he had drunk at any time in one day since he was born. Now, Karen, should I go on or should we just pronounce benediction? Dr. Bratton, Jackie, anybody why don't out you, there? Why don't you finish the story of Judith and then maybe the benediction? Should, <laughs> should, I, should I leave you all hanging right here or should I just? No, huh? no cliffhangers. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Judith, in the next chapter, Judith is left alone with Holofernes in his tent. She prays God to give her strength. Listen to this. Now when the evening was come, his servants made haste to depart. And Bagoa shut his tent without and dismissed the waiters from the presence of his Lord. And they went to their beds, for they were all weary because the feast had been long. And Judith was left alone in the tent, and Holofernes lying upon his bed, for he was filled with wine. Now Judith had commanded her maid to stand without her bed chamber. Don't you leave the bed. Don't you leave this tent. This, you stand at the door, she told her, and to wait for her coming forth, as she did daily. For she said she would go forth to her prayers, and she spake to Bagoas according to the same purpose. So she went to pray before going in to see the captain. So all went forth, and none was left in the bedchamber, neither little nor great. Then Judah, standing by his bed, said in her heart, O Lord God of all power, Look at this present upon the works of my hands for the exaltation of Jerusalem. For now is the time to help thine inheritance and to execute mine enterprises to the destruction of the enemies which are risen against us. Then she came to the pillar of the bed which was at Holofernes' head and took down his falchion from thence. Falchion. That's his sword, I think. Yeah, and approached it is. to his bed and took hold of his hair of his head. She took down his falchion, his sword, and approached to his head, to his bed, and took hold of the hair of his head, and said, Strengthen me, O Lord God of Israel, this day. And she smote twice upon his neck with all her might, 
and she took away his head from him. Ladies and gentlemen, she cut the dude's head off. Yep, she sure did. And, and tumbled his body down from the bed and pulled down the canopy from the pillars. And anon, after she went forth and gave Holofernes' head to her maid. Ladies and gentlemen, this lady was shrewd. She gave the head of the captain to her maid. And she put it in the bag of meat. The maid was carrying a bag of meat. So they twain went together according to their custom unto prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, she cut the dude's head off and then went to the prayer meeting. She cut the dude's head <laughs> off and went to the prayer meeting. Everybody in church ain't right, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody in church ain't right. Everybody didn't come to pray. <laughs> Karen, she cut the dude's head off. She smote him twice with the with the sword. Oh Lord, give me strength! Whack, whack! And then took his head and gave the head to her maid. Here, put this in the bag. Come on, let's go to prayer meeting. Oh, my <laughs> this Lord, Lord, Lord. Okay, okay. She put it in her bag of meat. So they twain together. Went twain together to their as was their custom unto prayer, and when they passed the camp, they compassed the valley and went up the mountain of Bethulia and came to the gates there all the time. She carrying that bag of meat, you know, got me some Kentucky fried, <laughs> a bag of Kentucky fried. Uh, what's that butter. red stuff? What's that yeah, red yeah. stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's red stuff. So, that's that barbecue sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Then said Judith afar off to the watchman at the gate, Open, open now the gate. God, even our God, is with us to show his power yet in Jerusalem and his forces against the enemy, as he hath even done this day. Now when the men of the city heard her voice, they made haste to go down to the gate of their city, and they called the elders of the city. And then they ran all together, both small and great, for it was strange unto them that she was come. So they opened the gate and received them, and made a fire for a light, and stood around about them. Then she said to them with a loud voice, Praise, praise God, praise God, I say, for he hath not taken away his mercy from the house of Israel, but hath destroyed our enemies by my hands this night. So she took the head out of the bag, and showed it, and said unto them, Behold, the head of Holofernes, the chief captain of the army of Assur, of the Assyrians, and behold the canopy which he did lie in his drunkenness, and the Lord hath smitten him by this hand of a woman. Whew, Brian, everybody grinning in your face don't, don't mean you any good. Y'all mean <laughs> oh, Jesus. And the Lord as the Lord liveth, who hath kept me in my way that I went, my countenance hath de deceived him to his destruction. She said, the Lord kept me cool. She kept me cool. My countenance kept me from uh, 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 fainting, and mm -hmm. I accomplished my mission. Okay. Then all the people were wonderfully astonished and bowed themselves and worshiped God and said with one accord, Blessed be thou, O our God, which has this day brought to naught the enemies of thy people. And so the rest of this is how they praise God and acclaim Judith. And then said Judith unto them, hear, hear me now, my brethren, and take this head and hang it upon the highest place of your walls. And as soon as the morning shall appear and the sun shall come forth upon the earth, take ye every one his weapons, and go forth every valiant man out of the city, and set ye a captain over them, as though ye would go down into the field toward the watch of the Assyrians, but not go down, but go not down. So they're going to spoil the Assyrians. Okay. Now therefore mm -hmm. okay, okay. Okay, they they, they they did that. Chapter fifteen. The Assyrians are chased and slain. The high priest cometh to see Judith. The stuff of Holofernes to 
is given to Judith, the woman, the women crown her with a garland, and she is made famous forever and ever. Chapter 16, the last chapter, the song of Judith. Okay, then began Judith to sing this Thanksgiving in all Israel, and all the people sang after her this song of praise. Okay, so she sang a song of praise unto the Lord. Okay, that was Judith, ladies and gentlemen. She was a bad sister. I mean, she was an actress, too. She was an actress. Okay, all right. So I'm not going to, I don't have time to go into the rest of Esther, but there's, a, there's more, and they claim that this is the end of the book of Esther that takes uh, place after uh, several chapters of Esther, and it describes the two men who were trying to kill the king, and Mordecai, Esther's cousin, found out, discovered the plot, and that's how Mordecai was elevated. Uh, and it talks about uh, Mordecai's elevation and the deliverance of the people, Esther's people. And then um, the final book I wanted to talk about tonight, The Wisdom of Solomon. Uh, this is a book about, it goes along with more like Ecclesiastics, uh, The Wisdom of Solomon. And um, I won't be able to read all of that tonight. Okay. Uh, but some of the things in these chapters in the wisdom of Solomon. The wicked thinks his, thinks his life is short and of no other after this. So the, the wicked don't believe in an afterlife. Therefore, they will take their pleasure in this and conspire against the just. And that which they do blinds them. So there's a lot of wisdom. Um, wisdom that's in this chapter, but it was not attributed to Solomon, okay? It's not believed that Solomon uh, put together this. Solomon was a compiler of great wisdom, and uh, he went all, all over the world getting information from libraries, but this was not accepted as being written by Solomon. So I share with you tonight several excerpts from some of the books of the Apocrypha, once again, we do not preach from the Apocrypha, although there's some good stories in here, but we get some good history. And, and then you get some pretty good fairy tales. So we don't know what's true and what's not. But, but even today, ladies and gentlemen, you must discern what is truth and what is not truth. Uh, um, some people don't, don't listen to the news anymore, so they're missing out on all altogether. Uh, they're not getting the truth, they're not, not getting the half-truth, so, but then they're missing out on the truth because some of what they're getting is truth. Okay, but we've got to discern whether what we're getting is truth. Even when you go to church, when you listen to a pastor, when the pastor opens that Bible, you have your Bible open. Don't let anybody pull anything over your eyes. Okay? When, when, the, when the, the world says, well, we've got wisdom that you all don't know about, that's why you need to join our organization. Say no, 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 a thousand times no. I'm not going to become a Masonic. You don't know any more than me. My God has revealed himself to me through the Holy Scriptures. And then you talk about Genesis through Revelation. Okay? And there's enough in Genesis, from Genesis to Revelation, to get us into heaven. Okay? Let the people have their social organizations and their their. Uh, uh, blasphemous beliefs but choose the truth Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no man comes unto the father but by me <clears throat> and we know that we know that we know that because we've been born again by the spirit of God we have the truth living in us and so let us study to show ourselves approved unto God workmen who needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth well, praise God. Jackie Carter, I'd like to turn this over to you, please, and lead us as you will. Thank you. Okay, there are no questions in the chat. Um, is there anything that anyone would like to comment on and share at this time? 
I was just thinking as we were going through the book of Judas that she is she was nothing like Esther, <laughs> uh, who went before the king, and and she was actually very humble and wanting to you know she went about saving saving her people in a totally different way. <laughs> yes, 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 Karen. May I, may I interject, Jackie? <clears throat> And the rest of Esther, just to piggyback on what Karen just said, in the rest of Esther, <clears throat> it talks about how, yes, Esther was much different from Judith, Karen. In the rest of Esther, in the Apocrypha, it says Esther was scared, not scared, Jean Bratton. She was scared. <laughs> she was shaking in her boots. Her knees mm-hmm. were buckling because when the king, according to the rest of Esther, the king looked at her, and and before he held out the royal scepter, he had an angry look on his face, like, "What? what hey, I didn't call for you." And 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 the, in the rest of Esther, it says she stumbled. She fell. She had to grab on to one of her maidens to maintain yep. her countenance, and she kept her cool and kept her face, even though she stumbled. And, and and that stumbling, she played it to her own benefit because the stumbling caused the king to catch her and hold her in her arms. And he looked at her beauty and said, what is it? What's your request? But mm-hmm. she was scared. She was totally different. Judith was bad. Judith wasn't trembling one bit. <laughs> Two smacks of the sword. Here, put this in the bag. I mean, like she just went to the <laughs> farmer's market. Cut those heads off that fish. P- wrap it up. Here, put this in the basket. Woo. <laughs> Back to you, Jackie Carter. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess I always try to look at things a little bit different because I'm thinking, too, that um, you're talking about a very young, inexperienced virgin versus a very seasoned um, widow. So that could have possibly played into a part of the differences between um, their boldness. Uh, I think in terms of similarities, they were both willing to do what they had to do in order to save um, someone else or save save their people. Um, Any other comments? Yes, something about Judith that we all need to think about is, as um, Apostle Carter told the story, she asked God, she prayed to God to be able to lie. God doesn't lie. This is why it is part of the apocryphal uh, books. She's praying to be able to lie. And if we look at the Gospel of John, uh, chapter eight forty four. Jesus clearly says who the father of lies is. He says, your father, Satan. So this is part of the reason why Judas is, was not canonized. Yeah. Let me add to what Dr. Jean Bratton is saying. There, there is an episode where God does permit a lying spirit to go and tell the king, okay? Even though God is not a liar, not the father of lies, he has permitted a lying spirit because he, at, at one point God says, I think it's in Isaiah, who will go and tell the king and yeah. deceive the king? And a lying spirit, violent. Oh, oh, that was in Second, Second, uh, Second Samuel? about Saul. Who's going mm-hmm. to go and deceive the king? Okay? So those lying spirits, uh, uh, one of those demons popped up and said, I'll go. I'll, I'll go. I'll lie to them. And so Judas had some help. Okay? And even though God does not honor lies, God permits lies. And remember the, the old prophet who God said, uh, Uh, when you finish your mission, you come straight home. Don't stop. Don't spend any time with anybody. Don't eat in anybody's house. And a lying spirit went to him. There are lying spirits going about. And the the scripture tells us the testing of our faith 
work is patience. And yeah. so many there are times we've got to deal with lying spirits, and God will allow a lying spirit to challenge our faith. Mm-hmm. And even as so now. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Jackie. I, I I turned it over to you, but I I had to leap back into it twice. <laughs> Jackie Carter, close it. Hey, Ben, Pastor Carter. What what I yes. found was most interesting is that the understanding of the canonization is something that we as a church should teach in new converts and new members class to give the new people their first taste of apologetics, so that they understand and able to defend the word and also understand why those books were canonized and the other ones weren't. Yes, it, it ought to be taught. It ought yep. to be taught. It ought yep. to be taught. Uh, even, even added to that, Pastor Sam, um, the whole story of how we got our Bible, how the Bible came through these translations, how people shared their blood just to get a copy of a manuscript into somebody's hand so that they could translate it. Thanks, Pastor. Jackie? I don't have anything else. Let them go home, then. Okay. Any other comments? All righty. Father God, we thank you for our lesson tonight, for enlightening us and opening our eyes to your truth, for giving us a greater understanding of the Apocrypha and the books that were shared tonight. Because indeed, uh, there is a purpose for everything. And we see now tonight that though these books were not canonized and they were not accepted by the Council of Nicaea, that they did hold some history, and that history can be uh, linked to things that we do know. So we thank you for this enlightenment so that we may be better able to stand and to speak on your behalf. We ask that you bless Pastor Carter, that you bless each one that was on tonight, and those that will hear the message later. Guide us and keep us safe, Lord Jesus, and help us to use wisdom as we continue to go through this period of uncertainty, and especially in terms of our, our health. Help us to remember, Father God, to wear our masks, to wash our hands, and to watch our distance, so that we may be wise and keep ourselves and our families safe. We ask now that you go with us. Grant us sweet rest tonight, and if it be thy will, allow us to arise again on the morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.